think most people are nearing the end or have ended there through verse 16. <clears throat> As you finish up, let's look at verse 17. You saw there how David receives the news of Saul's death. And now we're going to hear David's reaction. Verse 17. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And then you see it's a parenthetical phrase here. It puts in parentheses to kind of further explain. David wrote what we're about to read. It's a lamentation of David, a song or a poem over Saul and Jonathan, his son, after their death. And he didn't just write it for himself personally, but notice also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of, you see that the use of there is in italics, meaning uh, of the bow, it's, it's a title, the song of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. So it, evidently this is written down, and David as king commanded that they instruct this and teach this, that this be the legend, if you would, of Saul and Jonathan, what was said about them in their death. And here it is, verse 19. The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Those are two Philistine cities. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the earth uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew. Neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away. The shield of Saul as though he had not been anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O oh, Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen? And the weapons of war perished. Father, help us tonight as we study your word. Help us to see you and to obey that we can become more like you. That we can see the example of David and learn from it <clears throat> as we look to you. And through Jesus Christ's name we pray, asking for this understanding of your word. For it's by his name that we are saved. Amen. Why don't you look, if you would, <coughs> there in 2 Samuel chapter 1. Again, as I mentioned the last few weeks, we're kind of probably going to wrap up our study of Samuel for a little while, take a little bit of a break through the summer and focus on some other things. We have a couple missionaries coming throughout the summer on Wednesday nights, and we want to uh, give them time, and they'll speak, they'll focus. So for a little while, we're going to set aside uh, the story or the account of Samuel and Samuel as a book, remember first and second are written together. It's one book, and it is compiled to give us the life and the reign of David. First Samuel has really kind of set out to uh, establish David's legitimacy as king. This is why David can be and was the king. Second Samuel relays some of the accounts, some of the events of his life, his successes and his struggles, both as king as God's ruler but also as a man he struggles and so where we kind of end first Samuel and second Samuel picks up it's in my opinion a sort of a combination of the same story we see the end of Saul's life and I don't want to walk away though before we look at how David responded to it because I think there's much to learn from it as you start into second Samuel you know you have the death of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 31, very succinct account of his death, a sad ending. He spends the night before his death chasing after this woman with a familiar spirit that says summoning Samuel back from the dead. God is nowhere to be found in Samuel's life or Saul's life. He has rejected God. God has therefore rejected him 
He wants nothing to do. He has no personal relationship with the Lord. He spends his last night in fear, knowing that his death was coming, and he dies a violent death at the hand of the Philistines. And Israel's first king, anointed by God himself, ends in ruin with his sons, some of his sons, and with the men that he was leading. And the people of Israel are sent scattered, chased away, just like 1 Samuel began in chapter 4. Before they had a king, they are left back right where they started. Now we know under the current that David has been anointed, though, and we sense that there is something different about David. We have sensed that from the very beginning in how God spoke about David to Samuel and how uh, the Lord chose him over even, not just Israel, but even within his own family, his brothers that seem to appear more able or more will, or, or, or at least you'd say more capable than David was at that point, and how the Lord spoke of what was in David, not just what was outward in David. David just has seemed different than Saul from the very beginning. Saul is very pragmatic. Saul's worried about what everyone thinks. Saul is concerned about how people perceive him. David, in humility, is willing to serve others, help others, fight against giants, trust the Lord. I mean, it's, it's all under the current. Very quickly, it's established that Saul is not the guy, and David is going to be the guy. And so we expect that 2 Samuel is going to open with this big coronation. I mean, it's what would be fitting. Like it cuts from Saul, right? And, and it's a bloody battle. Uh, Saul's body is desecrated by the Philistines in humiliating fashion. And, and this close to this embarrassing reign of rejecting God. And, and you just sort of want and expect David, all of a sudden, he's the king Israel should want, right? He's the king that Israel should love. He'll be so much better than Saul. And so you picture David standing in front of this united Israel. And, and you, you picture that maybe they're bringing a throne out onto a, a marble walkway so that all of Israel can see him. And they're singing, remember that chorus? Saul killed thousands, but David has slain tens of thousands. And you just kind of imagine that David's going to step into this kingship this reign over Israel with God's blessing and with the blessing of the people a new crown maybe he'll fight off the Philistines that's what you expect but it's not what we get it's not what the Bible tells us happens after the death of Saul not only is David not immediately crowned <clears throat> but the kingdom of Israel is not even united when David is crowned in the next few chapters he's only crowned in a certain region of Judah. One of Saul's sons survived, Ishbosheth, and Abner sort of helped make him king over some of the northern tribes in the region. So David doesn't come in heralded, but rather David sort of eases in. It's a soft opening, if you would, to his kingship. Not what we would expect. And even his crowning is delayed for a moment by two things. By this odd story about the new, receiving the news from the mouth, not of one of the men of Israel, not from one of David's scouts, and not even from one of Saul's soldiers, but from one of the Amalekites, who David, just 48 hours before, has been slaying and killing the Amalekites because they took his wife and the families of the men that were with him. I mean, it's this odd paradox that here David is finding out joyful news that he's becoming king through the sorrow of the fact that Saul and his best friend Jonathan have been slain not from the mouth of someone from Israel but from someone who is an enemy to begin with it's an odd account and as we walk through it then we see David lamenting he expresses his grief so David does not enter the kingship of David does not begin with glory it begins with grief he comes with, he starts with struggle. But I want us to see tonight, we read those passages a moment ago, that David trusted God's word that says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he kind of foreshadows Jesus' words, love even your enemy. And David shows both of those things. So let's look at the chapter tonight. It has two very clear natural divisions. Verse 1 through 16 where David hears the news, and then verse 17 down to the end of chapter where David responds to it. And I just want to break it down in that way. David reflects 
this humility and love toward Saul and toward Jonathan. But how he receives the news is interesting. I think that the Bible gives us, that God gives us every word for a purpose. I think we can learn from it tonight. I want you to notice, number one, a deadly miscalculation. You'll see what we mean by that in a moment. The Amalekite man makes a deadly mistake, a grave miscalculation, if you would, on his part of what he thinks needs to be said and how he thinks David needs to hear it and what this news is going to usher in. And it's going to show us the difference between a heart that is cold toward the Lord and one that views God as glorious and therefore views his people as special. I want you to notice a couple of things about the actual man himself, about the person that brings the news. The Amalekite man brings the news of Israel's defeat about, and Saul and Jonathan's death. And notice as he comes in in verse number one, it tells us after the death of Saul, David has been in Ziklag for two days. So if you do the math, there was three days before the battle that David traveled back to his family. He finds out they're captured. Then there's two days of fighting to battle and get them back. Then there's two more days after that battle that David returns to Ziklag. And then, then on the third day, he hears the news. So it's about seven or eight days since David has left the Philistines, the battle with the Israelites happened. So Saul could have been dead here for anywhere from five to seven days. And David is waiting on the news. And this man brings the news. Notice in verse 2, he comes from the camp of Saul with his clothes torn and this dirt all over his head, which was the common way that they would grieve. Much of the world grieved that way in that point, but especially within Israel, they grieved this way, which gives us a little bit of a hint about the man in particular. And I want you to notice down in uh, verse number 13, there's something interesting said about the man. David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art there? Where are you from? And he answered, Notice this phrase, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. Now that's a very specific word when it says stranger. It means sojourner. That word is used all throughout the Old Testament of people, foreigners, that lived within the kingdom of Israel. They lived inside the land of Israel, but they weren't necessarily considered part of the people of Israel. They called them strangers, sojourners. Exodus 22 is very clear about how Israel was supposed to treat these people. It says, do not be harsh against them if they're going to live among you as peace. And then God gives this interesting statement. He says, because you were once sojourners in Egypt. So do not treat people that dwell in your land the way that Egypt treated, the, treated you when you were in their land. And so when this man says, I'm the son of a stranger, for a generation at least, his family seems to have lived in Israel. And then he says, I am an Amalekite. But it's not like an Amalekite that David has been battling against from some foreign place. This man seems to have been living in and amongst Israel. He is from the camp of Israel. He's coming back from the battle where Saul was, whatever purpose he was there. But it tells us that he's a little different than just a foreigner that was just walking through. He's part of this land of Israel. And notice in verse number 10, it says that he brings the crown and the bracelet or the armlet, to, uh, a piece that he would wear to signify Saul's position as king. And so this man comes grieving. He obviously knows the Israelite demeanor and how he's supposed to grieve. He brings these things that were Saul's, that showed that Saul was king, and he brings this news of Saul's death. And then notice the actual story that the man tells. David asked the man a series of questions, and it keeps it pretty simple for us as you walk through the verses he says where did you come from in verse number two and three the man falls down and he says he did obeisance that means he paid honor homage he was reverently bowing before him and then in verse three david says where'd you come from and the man's answer is i just escaped the camp of israel well when you're escaping something that's typically not good news that means something bad is happening so then david asks well how did it go Verse number four, how went the matter? How did it go? And here's his answer very simply. Israel has lost. Many have died. Saul and Jonathan are also dead. So that's the word that he brings back. Where'd you come from? I came from the battle, the camp of Israel, where David has been ostracized from his people and from Saul and Jonathan. I'm from there. Well, what happened? Many died. Israel has lost the battle. Philistines are moving into the cities. We have lost, and above all, 
our king Saul and Jonathan are dead. Now, if the story ends there, this guy may get off okay. But notice David asks him, he probes a little further. He says, well, how do you know this? How do you know that this is true? How are you sure that it's Saul and Jonathan? How are you positive that it's them that are dead? And notice the man's story. This is where it gets interesting. He says, I just happened to be in the area, and I found Saul. And Saul asked me to kill him, and so I did, because he was going to die anyway. That's basically what he says in verses 4 down through verse number 9. He says, the young man told him, uh, no, the young man that told him, as I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa. Now, there's something interesting about this account. If you have just read chapter 31, does anybody notice that there's some things that don't match? Right? There's some things that are not the same. Now, if you were to go over to 1 Chronicles 10, we won't tonight. If you were to go to 1 Chronicles 10, there's a second account of the death of Saul, and it matches perfectly with the account in 1 Samuel 31. So two biblical narrative accounts match the details of how Saul died. That Saul was wounded, that they were chasing after him. He assumed he was going to die. He did not want to be humiliated. He asked his armor bearer to kill him. His armor bearer in reverence and fear won't kill him, so Saul kills himself, and then his armor bearer kills himself. That's the account, that's the story. But this man says something different. And notice he just there's some things about this story that don't make sense. He says, I just happened on Mount Gilboa. Now I don't know about you, I like to hike, I like to go up mountains. We drive back and forth different places in West Virginia and western Virginia. We go up one of my kid my kids like to go up to a place called Seneca Rocks, and you walk up. It's a it's beautiful outlook. But I can tell you for sure, you don't just happen to be there. Like, like you don't just happen on the top of a mountain. Like, you go there. This and, and if he were out for a hike, why would you go hiking in the middle of a violent warfare battle? Doesn't make sense. There was some other reason that this guy is there, but he just says, I just, I just happen to be there. In fact, I'll let you look at it. Uh, the picture on the front and then the two pictures on the back, if you look at them, that is Mount Gilboa. You, you don't just happen to be walking through Mount Gilboa. It, it's in the middle of the Jezreel Valley. It's beautiful through the area, and it is flat, except for this area. So he happens to be going, he says. And then notice, as his story continues, behold, Saul leaned on his spear, which is... Significant. It's not the first time we've seen Saul doing this. Notice, and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. Now, red flag number two. You don't just happen to walk up a mountain that looks like this. And red flag number two is chariots and horsemen don't ride up mountains like this. It's hard to even tell how steep this is. You, you cannot ride a chariot up this mountain. In fact, that's probably part of why the men of Israel were fleeing up Mount Geboa is because the Philistines were known for their chariots and their horsemen, and they couldn't follow them up that far. Chapter 31 tells us archers hit him as he ran away. So maybe they're barrages shooting at him as he goes up the mountain. So David's inclination, he knows this area like the back of his hand. His, in, his, his ears are probably perking up a little. Wait a second. You just happen to be on Mount Geboa? And chariots were running up the mountain chasing Saul? Then notice, when he looked behind him, he saw me. I answered, Here am I. Who art thou? I'm an Amalekite. He said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me. Slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole within me. He says, I know I'm going to die, but I'm not dead yet. So I stood on him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. Doesn't this Amalekite's excuses and reasons sound a lot like Saul in his life? There was no other option. There was no other choice. And so after I killed him, I took his crown, and that's why I brought them to you. Now, we're left kind of wondering, what, what do we think about this? Is the account, that, is the differences in the account, is it just semantics? One person said one thing and one the other. David actually goes on to make it very clear what he thinks about it. Look at chapter 4, verse number 10. Chapter 4, verse number 10. This is important because it tells us a little bit about what's going on with this man. Chapter 4, verse 10. <clears throat> Here's what David's opinion was of the circumstance. He's later in a very similar circumstance, and this is his testimony. When one told me, when someone told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, 
who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. So David's very clear assessment of this situation is this man thinks that I'm going to reward him for being the one that killed my predecessor and made me king. Because notice he says, thinking he brought good tidings. Now, there's only a few ways that you can assume someone thinks they're bringing good news. For instance, John Tigner and I are going to communicate two different ways about something that's going to happen a little later this year. Kentucky plays Duke in the fall, and he's going to come in, and if he says, Kentucky beat Duke, it's very obvious that's not good news to him. Now, if I come to you and I say that, it's going to sound totally different. And how are you going to know that I feel differently? Because of my demeanor, because of my attitude, because of my words, because of my tone. So David, when he hears this man, says he thought he was bringing me good news. I could tell he wanted a reward. And so David sees this as a scheme. And notice David's response in verse 11 and 12. David truly mourns. He takes hold on his clothes. He rends them. Likewise, all the men that were with him, they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. This says something about David. Because David's predecessor is dead. David's going to become king. Like, that's a good thing. But a bad thing has happened to establish the good thing. And David truly mourns because David kept the big picture in mind. Yes, David's going to be the king, but here's the baseline truth. God's first anointed rebel king has fallen. Israel has lost the battle, and David's best friend is dead. What should that evoke in the life of a God-fearing man, of a God-believing man? It evokes grief, not joy, not opportunity. So what are we to take from these first 16 verses of this book of 2 Samuel chapter 1? We just summarized them there at the bottom. The downfall of God's rebellious people, maybe a servant, maybe a follower, a Christian. The downfall of God's people is to be lamented, never glorified. We are to take grief and not glee when God's people turn away and it leads to grave consequences. Number two, Using deceit for self-gain brings the judgment of God and dangerous consequences. This man uses deceit. He tells the story with some truth, but a little different. He sheds a light on himself that he hopes will lift him up. And we are tempted to do this. Maybe not in the exact same circumstances, but at work, on a project, in our marriages, as we are parenting, in our Christian lives. When there is something to be gained, am I willing to not be clear and truthful to gain it? That is a dangerous game. And it costs this man his life. And then finally, using the bitterness of others opportunistically does not lead us to obey Jesus' commands or reflect the work of God's Spirit in us. What do you mean by that? He thought, David has every reason to be bitter against Saul. I'm going to use that to my advantage. We should be very careful when we use in an opportunistic way how we know someone feels about someone else for our own gain because there is something at odds. And this is where I want to spend the, the rest of the evening tonight, the last few verses. <clears throat> and I just want to almost devotionally just think about it. And I want you to notice number two, the second Part of the passage is this. They, they distinctly break up. It almost probably feels like two sermons. It kind of is. I want you to notice, number two, this lament of grief. And I just want us to sit in this for a few minutes, just, just in our own lives. Because some of us are in the midst of a grieving moment. Some of us have been there recently. Some of us have the echoes of grief not too far back in the past. And some of us have stains of grief left from long ago, but not quite as painful or as vibrant maybe as they once were in our lives. And if none of those fit where we are tonight, then it's on its way. It's part of the human experience. And I want us to understand tonight as you read through, David is a man after God's heart, right? He's not a wuss. He's not just an emotional man. He is a man after God's heart. And I want us to see 
how he responds to a grief-filled moment. Grief is not a sign of sin or regret. Grief is a sign about truly caring about people and about truly understanding your God and what he's doing in this world. Grief is, no matter what society says, death is not just na it's not a natural part of life. Evolution would teach you death is just part of the natural part of the process thing. People live, people die. And Christianity has morphed this into some weird concept that says like, we live, we die, then we go to heaven, <laughs> glory! No! It's unnatural to die. It is the most unnatural experience as part of our lives. God didn't create us to die. Sin brought death. And it's egregious and it's awful. Does that mean we walk around in moaning and mourning all of our lives and that life is supposed to be miserable? No, but we should notice it. I worry about people, and I, I've been there in my own life. I worry about people who treat grief and death and loss missionally as this is something I have to get over. We sometimes treat it as like a badge of courage or we think of it as strong faith when we're able to just move on as if nothing ever happened that is the way our culture responds to that. American culture in the last 150 to 200 years is one of the only places in society in the history of man where death is treated as something you should just get past. That's not God's intent. And we see that in how David responds. There's a lot of impactful moments in the Bible, and after them, a lot of times they record poetry. Poems have been called an emergency of the soul. They express deep emotions when you see these poems in Scripture, from joy all the way to sorrow. And David expresses this here. He's overly gracious. This, he's writing this about his enemy, if you would. He has no pragmatic reason to express things this way. In other words, he's writing this out, kind of lifting up Saul, grieving Saul. This doesn't gain David anything. He, in fact, as king, he makes it be known around the land. You should learn this. This is what should be said about Saul and Jonathan. It doesn't gain him anything. But how David viewed God affected how David viewed people. And the way that his heart hurt expresses how God feels, in a way, if you would. God is not giddy. Yes, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints because it unites them with him in a way that they are intended to. But death itself is a scourge of sin, and that is why God is one day going to destroy it. So notice how David recognizes, or at least expresses this, and I think it's helpful. I, for myself, I've kind of jotted these things down, these points, as I kind of meditate and walk on it. I've walked through grief in my own life personally, over all kinds of different things. And I think that this is a helpful pattern to have for us. Not that I want to grieve again, but I think it would be helpful. So what I've done is kind of recognize what, what David expresses and then sort of rephrased it. Because most of us are not going to be king of a small empire nation led by God in some sort of theocracy and our predecessor is going to be killed and we're going to be conflicted about it. That's not going to happen. But grief will. And so notice these. David first recognizes that de death's brutal and final nature. Yes, I, under, I fully understand we will see our loved ones again. But he's saying, on this earth, in the way that I know them now, this is a, there's a finality to death and loss that is gripping to the soul. Notice, here's how we paraphrase it. This cannot be changed, and that is not easy. When we grieve the loss of someone that we love, we grieve a loss of relationship, whether it's in death or even in separation, when we lose something in this world that we cannot get back, it's not easy. We should turn our reliance to the Lord and recognize this cannot be changed. It doesn't make it better just to say, well, one day it's all going to be fine and taken care of. It helps us recognize our own sin and the consequences and effects of it and a reliance on the Lord for it. Notice, second, he shows disgust in the momentary triumph of evil things. Verse number 20. 
Don't talk about this in Gath. Don't let Ascalon know about this. Don't let the daughters of the Philistines rejoice in the way that the daughters of Israel had sung, Saul killed thousands, David tens of thousands. David knows that the head of Saul is being paraded about in the Philistine area, and it's grieving him. Evil looks like it is winning, and in this moment, there is evil triumphing. And David's heart says, this is not the way that things should be. And this is not the way that things will always be. Bad has happened. Righteous people, Jonathan dies. Righteous people bear the consequence of the actions of the unrighteous. And there are things in this world that are hard to explain that shouldn't be this way. Not because God is mean toward us, but because our sin was against the Lord and it comes with consequences. Parents shouldn't have to bury their children. Children shouldn't have to bury their parents. People should not suffer because of the evil and wrongdoing of others, but they do in this world, and it brings grief, and it is okay. The man after God's heart shows his disgust with that. He voices his anger at the circumstance. Verse 21, he curses the mountains of Gilboa. This would have been ironic. Even today, there's actually two nature preserves there in Israel on Mount Gilboa. You see in the bottom corner of that picture, it's known for vast array of wildflowers that bloom every spring at Mount Gilboa. So David is almost speaking with ironic tone. He says, curse, I wish you wouldn't grow ever again. That's how bad this is. So what is he doing? And then notice he mentions the mountain and he mentions the shield. They would oil their shields up and they would cover them to keep them limber so they wouldn't crack or break during the battle. And he says, he gives us this picture. He says, up there somewhere on Mount Gilboa, Saul's shield is laying there drying out. It's going to crack and disintegrate. This is not the way that things should be. And notice he shows anger. He, he wishes it weren't like this. And that's okay. There are things in our lives that trigger things in us or that's a sort of catchphrase even today where trigger may not be the right word but there's things that sort of make us think on, and we either try to embrace or avoid those things somehow and David shows us you, you can be upset at a circumstance that's happened it's a difference between being upset at the Lord who is sovereign and being upset that the circumstance happened the way that it did I have examples you know we have Joy and I we had a uh, a miscarriage early on. We had just moved into the house that we live in now. It's been a little more than 11 years ago, I guess about 11 years ago now. And we moved in right when we found out we were expecting and we were excited. And there's a room that we set aside as sort of a nursery area. We'd put things in there. And when that happened, for a little while, all we could really do was just close the room. It didn't really have anything in it. And we, we just closed the room. It, was just, it, just took, it took a long time to be like, I'm willing to go back in there. In fact, it was almost probably when we the next year when we found out we were expecting Ellie before we could really do that. Why? Because this is visually, this token, this thing that I see brings grief in my life, and I don't have to enjoy or like it. I, I, drive, I used to drive by my parents, my dad's old house. I used to drive by there every single day. I'd drive by there two and three times a day. I actually go a different way to work now. It's almost the exact same amount of mileage. It's a little bumpier road. I, I drive by that house maybe ten times a year now instead of three times a day. Why? Because in my heart, I can't stand that certain things have happened the way that they have. It doesn't mean that I don't trust the Lord, but it does mean that I can hate the sin that has brought death and the consequences of it. And that's okay to grieve. Notice David expresses respect for the good, acknowledges his success despite the failure of Saul. Verse 22 from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan, which he was famous for, the sword of Saul returned not empty. He said, Saul and Jonathan were not afraid to fight. Remember them as your hero, king, and prince, is what David says. He heralds the good. Did you ever notice that? Saul really wasn't afraid to fight. He never really backs off in fear. He's afraid of people's perception of him, and he's afraid of waiting to obey the Lord. But Saul was pretty valiant in battle overall, and David lifts up the good things. He says in verse 23 and 24, they were lovely and pleasant, swifter than eagles, strong like lions. Weep over them. In other words, he says in verse 24, he says, men and women of Israel, your life would not be the way that it is today if it were not for Saul and Jonathan. 
Did Saul have his issues? Yes. Did he try to murder David? Yes. Did he rebel against the Lord? Yes. But did God use this man's life in some way and fashion in others? He absolutely did. And David, in his grief, is willing to acknowledge that and even embrace it and to remember the good. Then notice, he perceives his own grief. He looks personally at it. The pain can't be escaped even in new and good things. Verse 26 says, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. The word distressed there means to be bound or tied, restricted. It's actually used sometimes as the word besieged, meaning I'm trapped, I cannot get what I need, and I cannot go out. He says, my soul, if you've ever been through certain amounts of grief in, in different moments of your life, that is a good way to express it. I am trapped right now. I can't get out, and nothing can get in. And he perceives that in his own heart and his own life. And he expresses, just very simply in verse 26, I loved Jonathan so much. And that's okay. It's okay that his heart was hurting. He expresses it. He says, even passing the love of women, he says it was different than romantic. There was a commitment and a love that we had to another that I never knew with another human being. Now don't, the world in, in some Modern scholarship has tried to spin this in some wicked way. You have a note there about it. We're not even going to give it the time of day this evening for that. No, he's just saying, my soul was knit with him, and so this really, really hurts. And then the last thing, he acknowledges with sorrow what has been lost. For thousands of years, the mighty have continued to fall. He says, the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war are perished. And ultimately, this should point our eyes to the one who never will. Because we're going to have moments where we say, this cannot be changed, and it is not easy. We're going to have moments as Christians where we say, this is not the way things should be, but it is also not the way that things will always be. What should have, could have saved Saul running up in Mount Gilboa led to a bitter death, and a broken shield. It hurts to think on them. The good that can be remembered can even add pain to the loss itself pain can't be escaped even when new and good things david's about to become the king but his heart still hurts it's okay to grieve it's okay to grieve for a while if it points our eyes toward the lord grief is actually a good thing and notice if you would on the back the last thing we'll just walk through it ultimately as we bring to a close these events that led to David's coronation, we can hear the story of our coming king. David was not the perfect king. Far from it. But he points our eyes to a better king. See if this story sounds familiar. It's the story of Adam with his Lord and with Satan the deceiver. It's the story of Saul and David, and it's our story. Notice this, God's chosen anointed ruler failed in his purpose he rebelled i keep thinking about genesis like adam was made to be the ruler of this earth in god's stead and he rebelled god sent a new king and anointed him but he did not crown him immediately just as god sent jesus christ to this earth to live a perfect life raised up on a cross for our sins death burial and resurrection but he is not fully coronated yet just as David was anointed, but waited to be crowned. The new king had a shepherd's heart, a love for God, and a passion for his people that the old king never did. The failed, rebellious king hated and rejected the new king in bitterness. But the new king did not strike the rebellious one in anger, but time and time again offered grace. And one day... Just before his eternal coronation, our new king will execute the deceiver who claims responsibility for the death of the rebel and will take back the crown for the glory of God and the good of his people. Just as Jesus will one day crush the head of the deceiver serpent, just as David executed the man who claimed to be the one who brought about the death of the rebel king, one day God will destroy sin and death and Satan, and he will be our eternal king forever. May our grief and our sorrow point our eyes toward him as it did David's.
Let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you for your word and for pointing our eyes to you. Help us to obey you. May we deal with our grief in a way that you have. Our society wants to numb us from death. America wants to pretend that death is natural. It just happens. It shouldn't affect us the way it does. But you have told us death is the reversal, physical death, the physical life that you gave. So we trust in the eternal life that we find in Jesus Christ, and we look forward to the day when death finds its death in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.